I am Rudolf Reeser, Chair of the Center for World Indigenous Studies Board of Directors. Indigenous nations, the United Nations, and a number of UN member states completed three years of discussions and negotiations that culminated in the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples in September 2014. The World Conference decided, among other things, to give consideration to the rights of Indigenous peoples in the already developed United Nations Millennium Development Goals document. Only three out of eight UN development goals were achieved by 2015. To speed up efforts, the UN decided to increase accomplishments by focusing on a global development agenda called the Post-2015 Development Agenda that would include Indigenous peoples' concerns. Some of the UN goals that were not achieved include promotion of macroeconomic policies that would prompt employment, agricultural, and industrial development, helping the poor in responding to inequalities, promote participatory community-led strategies aligned with member states' priorities and strategies, improving the delivery of services by governments, promoting respect and protection of all human rights, governmental transparency at the country and international levels, and promote the public-private partnership. The United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues seeks to encourage Fourth World nations to participate in a dialogue about the post-2015 development agenda. The Center for World Indigenous Studies joins this effort in a series of international dialogues to encourage a better understanding of what a post-2015 development agenda might contain from the perspective of indigenous nations. What are the fourth world political trends for 2015 and post-2015? What will be the major issues? How will conflicts between states and fourth world nations determine the agenda items proposed? Joining me in this dialogue, are experienced and knowledgeable scholars, journalists, and leaders. I welcome them to this webcast. The priorities that they suggest are recognition of indigenous peoples at the national and international levels. The second one is recognition of indigenous peoples' collective rights, in particular, the right to the land, territories, and natural resources, Assumption is the recognition is supposed to be the United Nations. Uh, thirdly, enactment of intercultural and cultural sensitive, culturally sensitive policies at the country level, especially in the area of education and health. I presume that's aimed at the various UN state members. Fourthly, prioritization of the special conditions and needs of indigenous women and children uh, youth and indigenous persons with disabilities. Five, recognition of culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development and the inclusion of the indigenous view of development with culture and identity. Six, enactment of the right to free prior and informed consent in all matters affecting indigenous peoples. I assume enactment here means states' parties. Establishment of partnerships for development issues relating to indigenous peoples. Now, all of this reads like shoulda, rather than how or when. Uh, I'd be interested, uh, John, have you any comments about these seven or any one of these seven uh, points uh, as suggested by the UN Permanent Forum as those likely agenda items for 2015 and beyond. I agree with you that they're all kind of shoulda, coulda type uh, proposals. You know, they all sound good in theory, uh, and I think they can have a benefit can can have a benefit for Indigenous peoples uh, around the world if they are 
uh, advance in a spirit of good faith and uh, you know m m mutual benefit with substance without without uh, states forcing indigenous peoples to uh, concede um, their lands, their rights, you know, the same old uh, agenda that uh, indigenous or fourth world peoples face. Um, I think, though, there's one point that really concerns me, and that's the um, the, the the final point: uh, developing partnerships uh, with fourth world nations for development. Uh, I think that is uh, a a massive problem around the world, uh, particularly in Canada, with the lengths that the government is is going to to forge uh, our relationship between specifically corporations and um, and band councils. Um, and in, in many cases, they're fostering a, uh, a violent um, divide between Indigenous peoples because they are um, putting so much pressure on band councils to get in on the action, right? To, to, to take their place in the uh, colonial endeavor by exploiting their own lands and using their own people as essentially work farms, even uh, in, in, in an extreme case. Uh, and, you know, fostering a dependency on the market economy, which opens the doors to an endless line of, uh, of exploitation to the point where uh, when there's no trees and there's no water and there's no stones left, you know, what's going to be left to exploit? Um, and, and that kind of seems to be the the path that Canada wants to go down, where um, indigenous lands are just stores, you know. Um, so, you know, that's the biggest concern I have is is is, is what are the intentions of that uh, supposed relationship that uh, that is being proposed. Uh, beyond that, um, yeah, I, I think there's potential for a lot of positive outcomes, but it's again, it's going to be contingent on the will of states and on the vigilance of fourth world nations to make sure that uh, indigenous uh, that uh, states act in good faith. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Dina, I I sense and detect in John's uh, remarks a, a little bit of queasiness about the prospect of promoting development per se. Uh, and uh, having indigenous nations and communities join in that enterprise as a priority at the United Nations. And as we all know, the United Nations Development Program and uh, most all of the priorities of the state institution we call the United Nations are aimed at exploiting raw materials and resources for expanding economic development. Uh, how do you see those seven points, and do you agree or disagree with with John? I really agree with John. I mean, I'm just as queasy about it as he is, and um, and it really points to the difference in in world views between you know, what we would call fourth world nations or indigenous peoples versus um, Western style governments and, you know, and the worldviews that they're based on. I mean, this, again, it's a normative issue about, you know, that, that points to the shoulds and the shouldas and the woulds and the couldas. But I think that, you know, we're talking about the capitalist paradigm and how it's so normalized in our modern world, and that is also, in fact, the the action, you know, the the thing that's responsible for the downfall of our environment, of our cultures, of our governments. Um, but so there's got to be. I mean, again, you know, you what you're asking is how do we know? that indigenous when indigenous peoples request that their cultures and their traditional knowledges and things like that are respected how do they know that they're be, being respected i think that's a really fundamental question and i think that um being assertive and going in there and not just being willing to ask that question or to, to demand that we, re, you know, we demand respect, but that we keep pushing the issue of 
how do we do this? Creating the mechanisms at the national levels, at the international levels. Um, you know, these are conversations that we've never had before, um, or maybe we've been having them amongst ourselves and been talking about it, but with states, governments, and in the international arena, I think that we're to some degree breaking new ground and we have to be willing to stay demanding about that and imagine new ways of um, of creating solutions of getting to those mechanisms rather than just expecting that the state governments are going to be benevolent and do the right thing. Thank you, Gina. Indigenous nation sovereignty and creating mechanisms for dialogue and negotiations between indigenous nations and UN member states seem to be two issues that could well require attention in the UN post-2015 development agenda. Our discussion seems to stress the importance of indigenous nations taking the initiative to gain political support for their sovereignty. It also seems important that indigenous nations take the initiative to form intergovernmental mechanisms with states to resolve political and violent conflicts. While the UN stresses economic goals, it seems the perspective of indigenous nations may well stress political goals for a post 2015 agenda.